Ladies and gentlemen, today I got a very special episode for you. Twenty years ago, there was this show that I remember very fondly. It's a show about about a secret agent dogs who are there to save the. Oh, no 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 no! Cut that garbage out. The show I'm talking about is none other than the short-lived Secret Files of the Spy Dogs. And in order to celebrate its 20th anniversary, I decided to to make a special episode with uh, with me and an interview with with none other than its creator. So let so so let's not waste any time, and let's get on with the show. Everyone and welcome to a special episode of my blogging, of my blogging, of my blogging channel, the Blogging Plaza. And today we got a special guest guest star with Jim Benson. Hi there. So introduce yourself for for a bit. Uh, my name is Jim Benton, and um, I'm the author and writer. Uh, I think that the reason why we're talking today is about a TV show that I created for Fox Kids yes. a long time ago called The Secret Files of the Spy Dogs. Yeah, that's that's a big reason we're we're here because right now we're celebrating 20 years uh, from uh, ever since that show came out. And to be honest, that show was a big inspiration, uh, big inspiration at least for me. It's kind of like a hidden capsule for for me and any any people who have seen it. So I still consider it a hidden gem of, of yours. So I'm very grateful for that. So, Thanks, Rick. So anyway, what drove you to, to be a cartoonist? Um, it's something that I had done since I was two, and um, I just kind of never stopped. I I drew cartoons when I was little, and uh, I I never stopped. I got big, and I kept drawing them. <laughs> I uh, yeah, I can I can see that. So anyway, uh, before we jump to the spy dog, can you tell us a little bit about your other remarkable works? Um, I did. Uh, I write a series called um, Franny K. Stein. Ah. I write a series called Dear Dumb Diary. This was made into a uh, movie. I made the movie with uh, Jerry Zucker. I do um, something called Victor Schmud. I do a character called It's Happy Bunny. Ah. It's a big licensing character. I do. Lot, I post a lot of cartoons online, and sometimes those are um, those cartoons are collected in books. So um, I do I do a lot of different stuff. I, I, I did saw them, and I, I absolutely adore them. I got to admit that my favorite of your cartoons is the one of the, of the Knight Kissing the Dragon. All right. Yeah, it's a popular one. Geek love. There's nothing like it. All right. So now we're going to start out with about talking about the secret files with the spy dog. So anyway, how the idea of the secret files with the spy dog was born? Uh, because I do I do so much in licensing and licensing overlaps a lot with uh, entertainment the entertainment business. Somebody just asked me one time if I had, if I had a show to pitch, and um, I said no nah, I don't have anything in mind but I could come up with something. So I just kind of started writing down a few ideas and before you knew it I had an idea that um, that I wanted to pitch and I pitched it at Fox Kids and they picked it up. And were you excited when it was picked it up? Uh, I was, but actually, it was the it was the first show like that I had ever pitched, and so it made me think that it was a lot easier than it actually is. It just turns out I was really lucky to get a show picked up on the first try. Oh yeah, and speaking of which, I did saw some of the promos and uh, promos, and there were some how can I say footage 
about apparently that the character looked very, very different from what they, you saw in the promo. They look a little bit rougher from the actual show. So I was wondering if that was from a pilot or something. I don't, I don't know if I know the, the promo. The way that we would work is that we would do, you know, I, I drew all the characters here. I designed the characters in the U.S. and we did the storyboards in the U.S. But then those were all shipped over to Korea for the animation to be done. And um, uh, Saban did not spend a lot of money on the animation. So uh, some of it might look better than, than others. Ah, I see. So was the series always focused on humor, or did you also intend it for some serious issue? Uh, we wanted to do, you know, it was mostly supposed to be funny, but we also wanted some action. And the director on it, his name is Will, was uh, Will Minio. And Will came from a background at Marvel. Will did a lot of stuff on Captain America and Spider-Man. He worked with Stan Lee. And oh. Will had a really, really great head for action, you know, for, for superhero kind of stuff. So because of that, um, there's a lot of that in it. You know, there's, there's, there's action and there is comedy both. Oh, speaking of Stan Lee, I do have a, I did, I did make a drawing of, of Stan Lee and, and I have an autograph of him that he oh. autographed. He's, he's, he's a very sweet guy. Yeah, here it is, just in case. Oh, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> All right, so anyway, now we're going to jump into this section of the production, the production of the series. Mm -hmm. So how much were you involved in the production? So what did you do in it? Uh, a great deal. Th this was the first thing that I had done, and the people at Fox Kids and Will were very generous and patient in teaching me uh, about animation and how to storyboard and stuff, because I basically knew, knew nothing about the process. But um, they sort of held my hand and taught me a lot and um, uh, accepted the fact that I didn't know a whole lot about it. But I was involved in everything. I was writing the stories. Mike Ryan um, was the head writer on the series. So I would write the story, then Mike would take that and he'd make the script out of the story I had written. And we'd go back and forth and punch up the jokes a little bit. And Mike was also very patient with me. He had, Mike had a lot of experience. He came off of uh, Cow and Chicken on Cartoon Network and, and uh, Powerpuff Girls and Dexter. He had done a lot of stuff for, at Cartoon Network. So then we would create the script and then that would go to Storyboard and then um, I would help with the storyboards, uh, go in and, and punch up the jokes a little bit, and then um, sit in on the recordings and try to get uh, try to you know offer suggestions on the um, the voice actors' performances. So uh, I was involved a, a great deal. I was working from Detroit at the time, and wow. production re production was in uh, Westwood, uh, uh, out in L.A. And so I was commuting once in a while. I was going back and forth every three weeks or so. But a lot of it just occurred through faxes and email and FedEx. So, Bob, did you write all the episodes yourself or you had some help? No, I wrote all this. I wrote what you would call the story. So I, I would write the storyline, sort of the main arc and what happened in it. And then Will would take that and he'd turn it into the script. And then we would go back and, you know, and I'd help punching up the script. So it was, so it was kind of collaborative. The, um, there was one that was a musical. And that was, I forget what the name of that episode was. Uh, but, I'll, I'll, uh, can, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but I do have a small question for that, but we'll get to that eventually. Okay. Uh, Easy, boy. Okay, now calm down. So, uh, but what was the usual schedule for the series production? Um, well, it, like everything took about, you know, 30 to 45 days to put it all together, and then it gets shipped to Korea. So, um, you know, four four to six weeks typically putting together an episode so technically how long did it take to finish at least one episode well uh after that part was done i guess the animation would take you know maybe um yes, i don't really remember i'm guessing maybe three or four months for that part of it so um but like i said it was pretty quick we were working fast i'm so proud all right so, as you can see, uh, we had a great set of voice actors in the series. I mean, we had Vicky Dolan, Mary Kate Bergman, Adam West, Jim Cummings, Jim Ward, Jeff Hardell, Steve Bradley Baker, Fred McNally, and so on, so on, so on. And what are your thoughts about them? Um, we were real lucky. When we were first 
uh, casting for the character of Dog Zero, Will and I were talking about who would be ideal for it. And so we had thrown back and forth um, Peter Graves and Adam West. Those were the two ones that we were thinking of. Peter Graves, you might remember, was the lead in Mission Impossible, oh. and so the, te the television series. I can, I can see why. I can see why they chose it. Yeah. So, um, you know, Will called back and said, we got Adam West. And so, and that was terrific. Then we, um, Mickey Dolenz was a lot of fun because he was, as you know, he was in the monkeys. I used to watch the monkeys when I was little. I watched Batman when I was little. So it was a lot of fun to cast some of these people that I knew when I was a kid, you know, to be able to cast them in the show. A lot of the other people, um, uh, you know, um, Billy West and uh, was, is, was also one of the characters. Billy West can do any voice you ask him to do. It's like oh, a machine. Oh yeah, I met I met him once in a Comic Con. He was great. Yeah. Fury to base, negative on package. We retrieved the wrong tape. Repeat, we retrieved the wrong tape. This is Agent Chuchi. This is an emergency. Invasion budget of ten million dollars now bankrupt. Mm -mm. The word on the street is that they're using genetic material in the tusk to create a herd of mastodons. Shut up and take my money. And Mary Kay Bergman, um, she was also the same way. She was, and she was also extremely good singer. She's very musical. So we had tremendous voice talent. Uh, yeah, and speaking of which, as you can see, over the course of this year, we lost two of these talented they cast. You know, Mary Kay Bergman and Adam West, with their souls. So, as a commemoration, uh, please tell us how you remembered it. Uh, Adam West, he would come in and he would bounce in like he was about 15 years old. He would charm every single woman in the room because he was very charming without being creepy. He was just, he had a nice way about him. He'd hop up in his chair and he was just happy to work. And he would take any kind of instruction from the voice director. Um, he was never a prima donna or a diva or anything like that. He was always a super friendly guy and um, just happy to be doing something. I bet you were sad when he passed away yes, last year. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mary Kay Bergman was um, a tremendous voice talent. You know, she also um, had done, she was doing the characters of the, the women characters on South Park yes, when, it first, I know. when it first came out. And she was doing like... Um, Oh, either Cinderella or Snow White for Disney. She was like one of the official voices for that. And she was just great. She was so talented and um, that she was a terrific loss. We were very sad when, when uh, Mary Kay passed away. Yeah, I'm not gonna go into details, but yeah, it was really sad. And trust, honestly, I was very shocked uh, to be honest. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, this is our, our little moment of silence for these two great actors that we just lost. So right. continuing on. Were there some areas in the storytelling that you tried to avoid? Uh, yeah, you know, we would never show Dog Zero. We always wanted that to be a mystery. And that the idea was that behind that was so that kids could always imagine that maybe their dog was Dog Zero. It could be any dog. Maybe I'm your neighbor's dog. Maybe I'm your grandma's dog. Maybe I'm your dog. Um, there was some stuff like, um, you know, anytime you write a script for uh, for broadcast television, you go, it's reviewed by a group called Broadcast Standards and Practices. Oh, those jarheads. There's somebody employed by the by the network or by the studio, by Saban at the time, and they go through and they say, well, you can't say this, you know. Like one time we had the word we called somebody a, um, a halfwit. And they say, you can't say halfwit. He bit him right on the ass. As you can see. And they had things like one of the weird ones was if we had a character depicted with spirals in their eyes, like they had been knocked out, we couldn't do spirals because somebody at Broadcast Standards and Practices believed that that was depicting drug use. So we had to show that a different way. So yeah, that's a little some, bit nagging. Yeah, there's some stuff that you just, I mean, that's just what, that's just what you do. That's the rules. Those are you the know, rules. You know, speaking of speaking of which about Doc Zero being, you know, all a mystery, I wouldn't be surprised if he was if that Doc Zero was actually Mayor West from Family Guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'll ask again. If I order a pizza, will anyone else have some? I might have a slice. Well, you know, I'm gonna need more of a commitment than that, Mark. 
So, uh, uh, by the way, speaking of that also, uh, were there some kind of deleted scene or rejected idea that you wanted to add to the series? We, you know, by the, we did um, basically a, almost two seasons, like a season and a half. So I had written a lot of stories sort of, um, you know, in anticipation. So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that we didn't get to do. Uh, yeah. Can you tell me at least one example that you wanted to do? There, were, there was one where um, uh, Catastrophe, who is our villain cat, had figured out how to extract the quality of cuteness. And so he was extracting the uh, cutenicity is what he called it. Oh, it, man. He was extracting it from dogs and isolating that chemistry to use, you know, to install it into cats to make cats as cute as puppies. So um, that was one. That's not fair. Cats are cute. Yeah. Well, uh, in in our universe, the puppy was sort of the pinnacle of cuteness. Uh, I see. Oh, and by the way, also, as many viewers noted, uh, the second season made a transition in it from cell animation to di digital animation. Was that process challenging, or did it affect a lot in the production series? It just it speeds things up a little bit, and it makes things look a little cleaner. The animation was still done traditionally, but the um, Coloring was digital, so it's just it's just a matter of um, the way that it was colored was different. And now we're going inside the world of the spider. So this is going to be a little bit more fun. So for the people who doesn't know, how what are the spiders? How do you tell what are the spiders? Um, it's. Uh, the premise is, is that all dogs everywhere are part of a secret organization that have been around forever uh, to keep human beings safe and to keep the world safe, and that they do this secretly. They communicate secretly, and they have a, an organization that's very sophisticated that they keep hidden. All right. Now tell us about the main trio of the series, which are Ralph, Mitzi, and, and Scribble. Right. So, And I have some of the toys here that we made for KFC. So... That's Ralph. Uh, yeah. Ralph's name was chosen because it's a name that a dog can actually say. It sounds like a dog bark. And he was voiced by uh, Mickey Dolan. Mickey Dolan, yeah. yeah. And he was, um, and Ralph is sort of our baseline. He's, when he's, uh, he has a perfect moral compass. He's always good. He's unfailingly brave and unfailingly kind. So um, Ralph is sort of like the typical dog. Like everything that's great about dogs is in Ralph. Yeah, I Today we will save these green fields for our children and their children's children and their children's 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 children. Oh, get on with us. Right. Dogs, follow me to freedom. And then Mitzi. His partner. His partner, right. Mitzi is very sweet and she's very smart, but also Mitzi is very strong. And a, little, she's, a little bit hot blooded, I can notice. Yeah, and she's she's hot blooded and she's aggressive. So Mitzi is that part of a dog that's sort of you know the watchdog type, you know. But I but I know but I I know that Ralph and Mitzi are they they technically share the same rank. The same the same what? Ranks the rank of, ranks. Of oh the yeah, dog. right, right. Yeah, they were the same rank. They were equals. Dog Chow was right. Every creature does deserve to live. And then um, Scribble, who was just, he was like a rookie. Yeah, and, he's adorable. Uh, yeah, and he was, um, he was just always sort of nervous and inarticulate, and he's, he's desperately trying to do the right thing. So he's that part of a dog's personality that always wants to please. So that's kind of, it's, we get different sides of a dog in those three characters. Let's, for, let's not forget that he's a big of blood. Yeah. Right. Oh, Scribble! No, it's... So, anyway, I, I, just by curiosity, how did Ralph and Mitzi became high, high rank agents? Um, you know, we never, really, we never really addressed that story, but I, I think it would be just because um, they were so earnest, that they were so good at what they did, and they and so you know, determined to do the right thing. I was wondering if both were trained by Zach Chong, because there were episodes that, the, that these two characters are trained by Zach Chong. Yeah, it could be, I guess, maybe. I mean, some of the story things, 
you you can almost you know the the viewer is free to to fill in the blanks because we sort of, we only write so much. <laughs> all right. And by the way, of all this slide dog also, how come Scribble was the only character back that's more puppy like compared to the others? Because well, because he was a puppy, because he was still a little kid. Uh, but there was an episode where there were puppies of the same age and they did talk. Oh, uh, I don't know, it's just because we thought it was funny, I guess. Yes! I'm gonna work hard and study and become a scientist and invent something like clean, safe nuclear fusion. And I'm going to train hard to become an astronaut and be the first dog to reach Neptune. And Scribble says he's not going to drink out of the toilet ever again. He says he didn't know people did that. That's Mickey Dolan's doing the, that gibberish, too. Oh, yeah. Mickey <laughs> Dolan did the voice of, uh, of Scribble as well. Speaking of gibberish, is that a good year? Oh, yeah. Okay. That's my phone ringtone. My sister's grabbing it. Okay, so have you ever thought on creating an episode about how the three characters met? Um, I, yeah, I, if we had gone long enough, I think that we could have. But the um, the the truth of it is, is that on uh, on Fox Kids at the time, and with Saban at the time, and still even, um, you know, uh, Heim Saban had Power Rangers, and Power Rangers were so enormously popular and so enormously profitable. It's very, very difficult to compete for attention and to, to compete for uh, for anything against a, a property, a television show that was that popular. So um, we were sort of always up against, um, you know, the, the truth was is no matter how good we did, we couldn't do as good as Power Rangers. Okay, blame it on me too. <laughs> if, so if we if we had had more time, I'm sure we would have explored a lot of shows, but we did what we could in the time we had. Okay, so tell me a little bit more about Doc Zero. Uh, I wonder why he has to be kept in secret, or, or I mean, in the world. I mean, in the yeah, world of Spider. Yeah, the idea was that um, the way in sort of in espionage now, um, a lot of people don't know who their contacts are, and that's because if they're captured, even under torture, they can't reveal it. So sometimes it's just a good idea for people to not be certain who the contacts are and that's the way that was the way we played it out is that nobody could know who dog zero was so that they could never reveal it to an enemy so it's, here's a fun question uh what will happen if it's revealed that dog zero was actually again a bayer west from family guy um well i think that'd be a very funny episode <laughs> the tradition with the spy dogs i will now reveal my true identity through this tape <laughs> I stand behind my decision. This press conference is over. I can't see you now. I can't hear you now. You're not here now. La 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 la. Uh, all right. So tell me about uh, uh, more of the other cast members, like for example, Angus, Von Rabi, and Frank. Um, well, the all of the the guys that that um, all the other cast members, in order to save budget, one of the things on animation that's really a good idea is if your actors can do a lot of different voices. So a lot of the people who were there, you know, we might have, you know, six or eight people in the booth recording, but the script might call for 30 different people to speak. We don't have the budget for 30 or different, 30 different voice actors. So the versatility of people like Billy West and Tress McNeil and uh, Mary Kay Bergman um, uh, was really, really important. They could all do a ton of different things. Hey, it's a living. You know, there is a character that I never, uh, I, I'm looking everywhere, but it doesn't list who was the voice actor. I'm, I'm talking about Ayana, uh, who voice actor her. Um, she was, uh, that was probably Mary Kay. Oh, Mary Kay also voiced Ayana? Yeah, that was probably her. Yeah. Oh yeah, just to a refreshment is the in Cindy Spider. Yeah, yeah. Too much testosterone for my liking. And um, the Irish setter, Aaron, uh, that was Tress did that one. Oh yeah, she uh, Ralph has a big crush on her. Has a big crush on her. This is it, Ralph. Loch Ness. Beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful. Ralph, the mission. Oh, oh yeah, right. 
uh, uh, what about Angus? I mean, what? I wonder why he, he's so crazy about being so racist against Chad. Well, Angus, well, because he's, you know, we just gave him a temper because he's, you know, he's very scientifically minded. He doesn't have a lot of patience for anything. And um, he's just, you know, he's meaner than the other spy dogs. Oh, what a girl. The kind you'd like to take home and meet mum. And maybe teach mum a thing or two. Mum with her. Is your homework done, Angus? And her, how are your studies coming along, Angus? Hey, mummy. I'd like you to meet this giant ladybug. She's here to cram my school books down your throat. But so, somehow, somehow he comes out with the, some of the bad lines in the show. Yeah, that's because, it's because he's so angry. He's one sick puppy. So, of all the character, which was your favorite fighter, both male and female? Um, probably Ralph. I mean, I like the idea of somebody who is, um, and because I grew up with Batman, I like the idea of the hero who um, who doesn't brutalize the the bad guy. You know, like he really has a good heart. He wants to he wants to save the day and do the right thing, but he's not cruel about it. So that was one of the things about Ralph that I always insisted on. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and your favorite female? female Mitzi. Fighter? Yeah, Mitzi. Mitzi? So the, yeah. the cartoon. Why? The, why? Uh, well, Mitzi, I like the fact that she was, you know, Mitzi was pretty and cute and small, but she was also, like, devastatingly powerful and good with weapons, and I like the idea of that hidden strength. Hey, don't hate me because I'm dutiful. Uh... Why did dog? Why did dogs feel obligated to protect mankind, especially since they live in a world where humans are really oblivious and really clumsy? Um, you know, I don't know. Dogs like people. I mean, dogs in the real world like people, and um, I mean, dogs in the real world protect people. So that's why. <laughs> fetch, boy, fetch! You know, some things are more important than paperwork. Like friendship and a really good belly rub. <sighs> uh, well, uh, by the way, no secret agent goes to a mission without their trusty dog gadgets. Hey, what, hey, how do you come up with them? The gadgets. Um, a lot of times, what we would do before we would, before we even started writing the series, I did page after page of just visual gags of different ways that you know a, a dog might use a bone or use a a couch or anything like that. So we had a ton of stuff that I had created that we could just slide in here and there. We could just put it in the episode. So really what it was, it was just a matter of sitting down and coming up with ideas. And um, by the way, isn't communicating from the toilet a little bit, well, unpractical? Yeah, except that that, they, that was how they hid that they were doing it because dogs appear to be drinking out of the toilet all the time. And so that's why they use the toilet to do that. You, you animal! Now, how do you come up with some of the villains, like Catastrophe, the Space Lush, and the Flea Nation? And which one was your favorite? Uh, probably Catastrophe was the favorite. He was one of the, he, they, we did an action figure of Catastrophe too. Oh. Um, he was probably the favorite because he was sort of modeled after Bond villains. You know, he had the, he had sort of the, you know, he was sophisticated and smart, and um, uh, yeah, I liked him the best. Now you shall be revived, and through you, my dear, I shall have the power to rule the world. <laughs> what? You don't get hairballs? What? What about the space lunch? Uh, they were okay, but, um, you know, I, I actually used to like, I actually watched a lot of James Bond as a kid, too. So um, I like the, I like Catastrophe. Now what we do. This all your fault. You both empty skull buckets of snuff. <laughs> 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 And the Flea Nation, they kind of remind me of the Russian, uh, kind of like Russian evil corporation, something like that. Yeah, they're yeah, they're just supposed to be sort of like um, indigenous, and they're um, you know they're just kind of like a huge group, 
a huge rotten group of bad guys. Okay, your agents are being held hostage by the Flea Nation. These are our demands. We want Ooh, lots of hairy big bags of plasma with like seven straws. Yeah, eh? Hair to call my very own, eh? And uh, uh, selling golf clubs, eh? A uh, ham. Sorry. And by the way, you know, as a cat lover, seeing cat portrayed as evil, I, I, like I said, it's a little bit of a nag. Uh, so that kind of makes me think that you had some kind of grudge against cats or something like that. No, I actually love cats as well. The um, I don't have a grudge against dogs or cats or anything. But it was it was one of those things in the because we're writing the dog universe, um, you know, the, just dogs and cats in the real world. They don't get along very well sometimes. So that was just what we played up on in the series. Like I have a choice. But if the series will have to go on, we'll, ha we'll have them bury a chance where we could see at least that they will be wrong. Like, for example, there will be good spy cat and traitor and spider. A absolutely that would be a great place to go yeah. yeah yeah i would have loved to see you know that they find out that there are cats that are actually good and spy dogs that they were actually traitors yeah yeah that would be that would be a good place to go and, and by the way speaking of villains i want to admit you that my favorite one shot villain was dr d cell that's pronounced the cell you idiot machine yeah uh, do you remember him yeah sure so yeah, tell me it, about him i really well, love this guy well, we, I mean, the the, um, the different villains, like sometimes we'd come up with the name first and sometimes we'd come up with the with the uh, actor first. The, one of the ones that I liked the best was um, uh, uh, Bones. And he, that was, um, oh, what was the actor's name? I forget the actor's name, but. I alone appreciate the true beauty of meat. Most people don't know their rumps from a whole pound of ground. More beef bouillon, barren bone. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, 100% kosher. But, uh, you know, we always did these bits at the at the end over the end credits where they're talking. Yeah. And so in that one, in that particular, that particular character, he was trying to corner the market on all the meat in the world. And he, um, uh, in the end of that sequence, like over the end credit, we hear him talking to his doctor. And his doctor's telling him that he's got to switch to salads. Oh yeah, and that we always love doing those little bits over the the end credits. And uh, what about Doctor Nissel? Uh, because I understand his frustration that you know every time we get new technology and he uh, and when you get that technology, everyone else gets an upgrade. Yeah, um, I, you know I I don't I don't know exactly what I can tell you about the character I, like some of the things sort of live up just sort of stand on their own i can see that I, I, like, again he was my favorite of all this one shot mm. i swear it whoever you are i'll be the voice on the other end of the phone when you call technical support i'll be the man who installs your cable incorrectly when your computer crashes it will be me and by the way many episodes are for are as you can see parody from from many movies so, i mean like there's portzilla the pups the charlie the angels and how do you come up with parody? Um, we just sort of, you know, um, would do the things that we liked. Porkzilla was was one of the ones that um, that I liked a lot when I was a kid. Um, I used to run home to watch Monster Week on television, and I always really, really liked Godzilla. So um, that's just kind of why I wrote it. You just the the fun thing is is when you're writing stuff like this, you just write what you like. Yeah, I know. There's a scene that you parodied in 1998 Godzilla where, where he put the foot uh, near one of the dogs, like that movie. Yeah. All right, so now here's the juicy part. As I, as I said, one of the most memorable episodes was, of course, the musical, Doggy Man. And I, I noticed it was a passionate approach. I shed some pink hair on her sofa And lost some pink hair on her chair And though she's always said not to shed in bed I think there's pink hair everywhere <laughs> Tell us Ralph, tell us Ralph what the scribble say Scribble says, scribble says he heard the space looks far away <laughs> There's a famous canine greeting we exchanged at every meeting. We stopped to sniff the doggies in my time. Oh! 
in the outback every night I kept them all safe from the dingoes by Then I heard her call And I really took the fall She was the cutest little dingo you'd ever see And the sweet dingo love song was a call in me uh, How did the idea came up? And, and did you write the song? That was, that was mostly um, Will Minio wanted to do that one and Will wrote the songs and, you know, we sort of kind of helped with the storyline a little bit. But um, Will was very passionate about that. And Will's very good at writing music as it, we didn't know it until then. But uh, it turns out he's very good at the at the lyrics. And he worked with the uh, with the music director on the show. And um, yeah, that one that one was probably more Will than anybody. Trust me, because I see many people who know the show. That's actually the one that many, many remember. Yeah, well, he he did a like I said, he did a great job. Will Will had a real flair for that. So all the all, all the voice actors did it, don't they? Yes. Mm -hmm. I really dread the morning light. Oh, I really dread the morning light. All right, if the series will have run longer, will you have been able to have? other characters that appear in one episode to return for more cases like Manji. Oh sure. I mean it, anything that the anything that the viewers liked, I'm sure we would have brought back. We I mean you you make the show for people to like. So if something if something sparked with people, yeah, we would have brought it back. Do you know I submitted the requisition for that crossing light to be fixed weeks ago? Bureaucrats. If I had the right parts I'd fix it myself. That delivery truck gets there every day right when the ten forty five freight is coming through. No telling what might happen. I will say that one of my favorite characters was actually the ass. Uh, what what can you tell me about them? What, what was it again? I couldn't. The Afghans, the 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 the, the, the Dixie trio from the parody, the Charlie's Angels. Oh yeah, Charlie's Angels. Yeah, that was I, at the time. Um, again, this is just one of the things we just kept going for all of the things that we liked, that we thought was funny, and um, the uh, Afghans, the dog. Sort of have a reputation of, you know, they have beautiful hair, but it's not the smartest breed. The door's closed. How do we open it? If only Bree were here, she'd know what to do. Maybe we should try this round knob thingy. Agent Mitzi reporting in. And so that was kind of why we went with the. Uh, that's why we went with the Afghans. Uh, just that I will say that for a furry brand, they're actually pretty beautiful. Yeah. So anyway, so. Do you think Chauncey could be next president? Uh, yeah, I would take that. I would take him as the next president. <laughs> All right, so now we go for three miscellaneous questions in order to finish this. So okay. the first one is that maybe probably you don't know, but two or three years later after the show, a similar show appeared on Cartoon Network, and that show that is that instead of dogs fighting fighting evil, it's about children fighting the tyranny of adulthood. Yeah, that was the um, it was the so, Treehouse or something, yeah, right? So, yeah, the show was called Codename Kids Next Door. I really yeah. also love that show, but also still remind me of Fight On. Yeah, so, it was a it was a great show. So I have a fun question: What will happen if the spy dog uh, meet the kid next door? I, will, I, th I think that they would. I think that they would admire their mission, and um, and probably do everything they could to help. Uh, oh yeah, but so it would be great if they could have a crossover. Yeah, it would be great. Crossovers are always a lot of fun. That is brilliant. Uh, yeah, I will be open. I don't, to that. I don't know. I don't know if Disney and Cartoon Network. I mean, Disney owns Spy Dogs now. It's in a vault somewhere. But um, yeah, I don't know if they if the networks would have done a crossover because they don't always do that. This is stupid. Hey, if Kingdom Heart if Kingdom Heart managed to join SquareSoft and Disney, nothing oh. is possible. Right. Okay. So, uh, by the way, are you open for a revival of the series? Uh, yeah, but that would be up to Disney. You know, that's Disney. Disney bought Fox Fox Kids, mm -hmm. and with it, they bought the rights to every for just about everything. So um, Disney owns it. 
So, uh, and if that happens, what element of the theory will you change or key or what would you suggest? Um, I, I would suggest more expensive animation. Like, um, like to get a little bit better animation, I would like. Other than that, you know, um, we'd have to recast Dog Zero, of course. And, um, and uh, Mary Kay Bergman, too. Mary Kay Bergman, right. Her voice isn't as distinctive. Adam, voice, Adam West's voice is, very, I think, very hard to reproduce. So, um, uh, I, think yeah, Gray, I, think, I think Gray Delilah could be the closest. Yeah, it could be. So anyway, so I, I think I would just I would keep on with the same sort of idea and just have more new villains. Sometimes it's a necessary evil. That's cool. And by the way, can you give us a little bit of a closing uh, closing comment for this interview? Um, let's see. Always, always be good to your dogs. And cats too. And cats too. Right. So, so anything, anything special that you want to say to commemorate the 20th anniversary of the show? Um, I'm glad that you like the show. I'm glad that people still, everybody else still likes. It. Well, some people like the show. Nice. I really thank you. Oh, and before we go, uh, Mr. Benson, I have a special gift for you. Okay. I, have, I want to give you this fan art that I made for my, myself. Uh, here, I drop it on the Skype chat, and I hope you like it. Just a scan. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's that's terrific. I hope I hope you really really like it. Yeah, I do. It's terrific. Nice nice job. So anyway, I I really thank you. That was a great interview, and it's an honor to to have you here for this special episode of the Blogging Plaza. If if you want, I can. If you want, when I finish making the edit editing of this of this interview, I can send I can send you the link. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Benton. I hope you have a great day. Thanks. You too. Say goodbye. Bye. Well, that was fun. But I have the feeling that there's still some questions that I just forgot to ask. I know, keep it professional, but I can't help myself wondering, who are the superiors of Doc Zero? Who paid for the collateral damage they create? Why didn't this come out on Blu-ray or DVD? Oh, wait, this evolved. Probably next to Song of the South. Uh, <laughs> apologies. I was getting carried away with my nitpick. Oh, a petition for a serious comeback? Make it happen! <laughs>